Good afternoon. I call our meeting to order. Thank you all for being here today and welcome to the third informational hearing of the Public Health and Developmental Services Committee sitting in the second special session. Uh, the special session was called by the governor to address important issues not resolved in this year's budget. The governor's proclamation emphasized the lack of adequate funding to restore and increase rates for those who provide essential services to patients and consumers in the Medi-Cal and developmental services programs and for the reauthorization of the MCO tax. This committee's charge is to find ways to increase funding in order to expand access and improve oversight of the Medi-Cal and developmental services programs. And I want to express this committee's appreciation to all of our panelists and participants and members of the public who are here today. This committee is embarking on important work and your input and involvement is, invi is vital to helping shape those solutions. With yesterday's hearing focused on developmental services and today's on Medi-Cal, we are continuing the committee's effort to learn more about and dig deeper into the major issues surrounding these programs. The goal is to provide us the information we need as a committee to craft solutions that will place these two important programs on sound and sustainable financial footing. At this point, I'd like to ask if any, there are any other members of the committee who would like to make opening remarks. You need not, but I want to provide the opportunity. Mr. Levine. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, your leadership on this and, and the fact that we are at our third oversight hearing means that we're taking this issue very seriously. When I learned that 5.2 million California children rely on Medi-Cal, I was really surprised by that staggeringly high number. That's nearly half of all California children, and uh, their access to health care is uh, too great to put at risk. And I think that we need to resolve this issue now, uh, and I'm really glad to be able to hear and learn more today uh, to address this. Thank you, Mr. Levine. With that, let's go to our first panel. We have a, a panel on Medi uh, Medi-Cal program status report. We have Mary Cantwell, Chief Deputy Director, Department of Healthcare Services. Welcome, Ms. Cantwell. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your participation and engagement. Thanks so much for having me, Mary Cantwell, DHCS. What I thought I would do is um, really talk about one area that has been a big focus for the department really over the last year, culminating in the waiver proposal that we submitted to CMS, because I think that that really encompasses really the direction that the department is trying to take the Medi-Cal program. Um, as we've talked about in, in prior, prior hearings, we have a current 1115 waiver that expires in 74 days, November 1st of this year. And that, the focus of that waiver had really been uh, the expansion of coverage that, you, that we've seen over the last five years and the beginnings of delivery system transformation and really was the, one of the core reasons why California and our Medicaid program is really a leader in the country with respect to Medicaid, both in terms of the types of services we cover, the way we cover, and the way that we ensure that our patients are being able to have services that they, that they critically need. But what we, when we've looked across our delivery system and across the programs that we're operating, what we see is an opportunity to take that to the next step. We've covered now um, almost an additional 4 million people in our program. We're, we're getting close to 12, 12 and a half million people in the Medi-Cal program. And what we want to make sure is that the delivery system is there to provide them the most appropriate care in the right setting at the right time in a way that's most accessible to them. And one of the ways that we really think we can do that is by t thinking differently about how the delivery system needs to be structured and how we pay for care. And so the 1115 waiver that we've proposed to CMS is a $17 billion federally funded waiver of which $14 billion would be devoted to delivery system transformation and payments to providers and health plans for changing the way that they deliver care with a focus on primary care and prevention, trying to move away from preventable events in the emergency room and hospitals so that individuals are able to access primary care in their community and not end up with uh, with complications that could be avoided had we seen them earlier, sort of more um, early on in the 
in their need for health services. And so tr our, our, with our efforts of making sure that everyone has a usual source of care, it's one of the statewide goals we're proposing to CMS as a measure in our waiver that we would be looking at making sure that everyone has someone to go to, whether that's a primary care doctor, which makes sense for most populations, but for some it needs to be a specialty care physician. And so how do we look at making sure that individuals are receiving the, the usual source of care that they need so that they have some place to go and someone coordinating their care? We're looking at expanding opportunities for using other types of providers so that community health workers, um, patient navigators, all of those individuals who can help someone navigate the healthcare system them so that when they do need to get care, they know where they can go and that there's someone who's looking out for the, for the whole scope of their services. So as I mentioned, $14 billion of the $17 billion is really focused on that. It's in six different areas and strategies going across our delivery system, looking at managed care transformation, which would include both trying to change the way that our plans look at how they pay and deliver care, um, as well as the providers that are in those plans. We also know that we still have a fairly significant population in fee-for-service. Now it's a different population than those who are in managed care, but there certainly remain needs for ensuring access in, uh, to appropriate care there. And so particularly we're focused in the waiver on two key areas in fee-for-service related to maternity care. Given the significant role that Medi-Cal plays in maternity care, we, we are actually pay for more than half of the births in the state of California. And then as we've talked about in various committees here, um, a real focus on dental and wanting to improve the services that are being provided to both children and adults and looking at how do we look to pay differently and change the incentives that exist so that we can both increase access, which I know has been a, a concern, but also make sure that the outcomes are being looked at so that we're providing the right types of care. We're also looking at our public safety net systems who today rely on waiver funding for significant improvement that they've done in their delivery system. We've seen over close to 700,000 patients in our public safety net system get primary care homes. We've seen significant decreases in in patient safety issues in those hospitals because of what we were able to accomplish in the last waiver. We want to build on that, build on the use of EHRs so that information can be translated between different systems and really continue to focus on primary care. The, the next item is, relates to access and, and workforce issues, looking at how do we both increase participation from those providers who today aren't participating in the Medi-Cal program, but also, as I mentioned earlier, really looking at other types of providers that maybe we don't utilize today to the best of that ability, including, as I mentioned, community health workers. And then two other key elements of the waiver where we really think we're being um, forward thinking compared to the rest of the nation in, in Medicaid is a focus on increasing access to supportive housing and how do we actually help people stay in their home or also get out of institutions and into their home and provide the supportive services that they need uh, through the Medicaid program. And then finally, the last of the six elements that that $14 billion includes relates to looking to communities who are perhaps better integrated today and ready to take a step forward with both the health plans and the providers and the counties and encouraging applications for whole person care pilots where there would be funding available to the various participants in that delivery system for working together to improve the outcomes for, a, for high utilizer populations including those who experience homelessness and really again looking at how do we drive change in the way that care is delivered to those populations. So that's a that $14 billion that we're looking for is really critical to helping to drive the, the vision that we have. And we're calling the, the waiver Medi-Cal 2020 because we are looking at how can, the, how can the delivery system that we have today look different in five years so that we've helped to drive value-based change instead of just paying for services. How do we actually start paying for value and paying for outcomes? We know that you can't just institute that, can't start just reallocating the money that's there today. So we've sought this waiver to be additional money on top of what's currently there so we can figure out what are the best ways to change the way that we will be paying providers so that in five years it's just a built-in part of the way that we operate the program. The remaining money in the, in the waiver is, is related to the remaining uninsured. Again, we're, we're still going to have a lot of individuals who are not in coverage in California. 
We currently have funding under the waiver that we utilize in, in conjunction with uh, hospital funding for the disproportionate share hospitals, uh, the public hospitals. And we're actually looking at, again, transforming the way that that money flows. Today, that money is linked to cost. So if you have a cost of providing services to the uninsured, you get a portion of that funding in our, in our public safety net system. But that isn't the best way to drive change. There's also not a lot of support in that funding for services outside of a hospital setting. Almost all of that funding is required to go towards hospital services, inpatient services, emergency room services, and other outpatient hospital services. But it's actually prohibited from a federal perspective, the way it's currently structured, from being used for primary care outside of a hospital setting. And so we have proposed uh, a global payment system for the uninsured that the rest of that, the $3 billion of the $17 billion is linked to, where instead of paying based on cost, and instead of it being hospital focused, we want to shift the money so that those providers, our public safety net systems who are so critical for the remaining uninsured population, are able to use the funding to support primary care and preventive prevention. The same way that we're talking about what we're trying to accomplish on the Medi-Cal side, we want to do that for the remaining uninsured with this global payment proposal. So we're continuing to be in those negotiations with CMS. Um, we, you know, we've had really positive response to the proposals that we've laid out, and CMS shares our goal, that at the end of the day, what we want to talk about is a system that's based on value and not looking at volume and cost, and that we'd be looking at outcomes and not just providing services, but making sure that we're providing the right services. So we're hopeful that we will achieve a waiver from the federal government that will enable us to, to move forward with these. Obviously, $17 billion is a significant ask to the federal government, but we believe that it will help at, in the long run save costs as well as improve outcomes, and, and we certainly think that we have a case for that. So that's really been the focus of certainly my job on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also all-encompassing of the department that all of the things that we're working on in terms of improving the way that our managed care plans operate, all the changes we're looking to make on the dental side to improve the, the issues that have been raised there, all of those really are feeding into what we're talking about with this waiver in looking to transform the, the rest of the delivery system. Outside of the waiver, we continue to look at ways to do that as well, including looking at payment reform for other types of providers. Again, looking at how do you incentivize the right behavior, helping to expand access, but also with, a, with that focus on outcomes. And then just briefly, um, just given that I know that the last time I was here, we talked about the MCO tax. You know, we continue to be open and working with folks on are there other options for that tax uh, different structures that would still achieve the same goals that, of the funding that, that we're talking about in terms of the $1.35 billion so that we don't have a hole there, so we're not starting in a negative place, but that we're at least um, at the same place of having the same amount of funding and, and, of course, having the waiver be additional funding from what we have today. So we continue to have those conversations um, and continue to provide technical assistance as needed for those who are asking for it. And, you know, we continue to believe that it's a critical thing to resolve so that we don't have a situation where we're talking about additional funding on one hand with respect to the waiver, but a loss of funding on the other hand with respect to the MCO tax. So I'll stop there and see what types of questions you all might have. Thank you, Ms. Cantwell. Do members have any questions or comments? Dr. Wood. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You talked about, you talked about $14 billion for planning, modernization. I assume, are there... Are there, is that program implementation? Is the, are there and there are timelines associated sure. with that? And and what is that? What does that really look like? Uh, because fourteen billion dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> sure. So that would be fourteen billion dollars over five the next five years, and those would be that that funding would specifically be for uh, value based incentive payments for providers and plans. Describe that if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> um, so we, what we have proposed, is, again, those six different strategy areas that I mentioned, um, we're continuing to work through the details with CMS, but the, the, what we've come up with are one, three overarching goals that we, to measure at, at a state level, and that would be a percent of payments that are moving to value-based payments a look at the reduction of emergency room utilization, and as I mentioned, um, the usual source of care measure. So those are statewide goals. Each of those incentive programs that would encompass that, that, that funding would be very similar to what we have today in what we call our DISRIP, and that's right now limited to the public hospital systems. And there are particular projects and metrics associated with that. So for example, um, as I mentioned, we had, we saw you know, close to 700,000 
uh, individuals get impaneled into primary care homes in the public hospital systems under the existing DSRIP. Those are the kinds of measures we would be looking at. Um, so we would be looking at outcomes measures with respect to particular uh, disease categories like diabetes or other chronic conditions. And there would be a menu of things and depends on each of the, there's a lot of <laughs> detail, but it depends on each of the, the six programs we're talking about. But what we would have is a set of required measures for plans and providers to participate in the incentive pool, and that would relate to things like emergency remutilization, inpatient utilization, clinical outcomes measures, and there would be the ability to earn these payments for meeting those metrics. Um, so it would be obviously many, many hundreds at the end of the day of different types of incentive payments that would go depending on which of the six structures you were in. Follow up if that's okay, sir? Please. Uh, yeah, um, and then... Um, uh, how does how does some of this translate to uh, rural communities, for example? Uh, different challenges, um, mm -hmm. and uh, access is a big issue whether you're whether you're in an urban area or a rural area. But the challenges are different in, in, in rural areas where we're frankly somewhat spread out. Transportation mm -hmm. is a challenge. Uh, just the, just providers in general, the yep. number are a challenge. And so, do you have strategies that you're working on there? Because I didn't hear that in any of the planning that you were talking about. Yes, yeah, so some of the specific things we've been looking at relate to how do you structure these same types of incentives to work in different areas. So we sort of the recognition that you can't have the same types of either requirements or outcomes because the populations are very different as well as the, the, the numbers of, of, of individuals that are being served. And so that will be one of the things we'll need to work through as we get to the detail of who's going to participate. Um, particularly when I think of, you know, looking at the, the counties and the plans working together, how do, how do we actually go to those communities and say what, would, what makes sense for what you need to see? So that's why one of the proposals we have is the whole person care pilots, because we can't presume that we know at the local level what is needed to make access better to help improve outcomes because we're sort of at you know this 50,000 foot level and so that's one of the things we're really excited about is tell us what would work for that community so that we can then structure an incentive program that's going to work for you. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments from members? Mr. Steinroth. Thank you very much for sure. your presentation so far. In your original um, description you talked about how this might actually impact housing as well. Mm -hmm. Could you be more specific? Sure. So we have asked the federal government to help us uh, allow the use of essentially what would be costs of things that, you know, sort of, we want to use the savings that are generated from helping people stay in, at home or move out of, an, uh, out of an institution to help fund being able to stay in your home. So just a little bit of background. Technically, Medicaid can't pay for housing. <laughs> so there's always been this struggle with CMS, and they have yet to approve anything that's specific about Medicaid funding housing. But our proposal has been, we believe that you can incentivize outcomes that you can, where you can only achieve those outcomes if someone has housing, right? So you can only improve someone's health outcomes if they're actually in their home and not living on the street. And so what we're asking for is the ability for our plans and our providers and counties to be able to receive funding for achieving those outcomes that only can be achieved if they have housing. And so it's sort of a, a little bit of a circular way to get there, but we know that there's a lot of interest in, in particular communities, but across the state with our counties and our health plans and our community-based organizations to figure out ways to support that. And so we think if that funding is there to for the outcomes Piece, that there will be the ability to put together what's needed to help people stay in their home. If I could have a follow-up. Um, out of the $14 billion, have you been able to identify what percentage of that would be directed towards this? We have not yet. Part of that is the back and forth with CMS. California proposed the $17 billion program. Um, the federal government has to agree to that. And so at this point in time, we're continuing to negotiate with them on are they supportive of that full request so that then we can get to that next layer of detail of figuring out, as I mentioned, there's six high-level strategy programs, how much of the money goes into each of those, but sort of we can't get there until we know where are they with the total ask in terms of the total $17 billion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Levine. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your leadership on this issue and the hard work that you've been putting in, obviously, over the course of much longer than the um, extraordinary session, but also a lot of the work that led us to here, sure. particularly on trying to figure out the MCO tax specifically, mm -hmm. uh, which if we don't figure out what that could mean, could, could mean dire consequences for people who rely on Medi-Cal. As you've um, studied this and come up with different options, what are some of the policy and also practical considerations that may lead towards um, a, a positive outcome, a long-term solution for this? For the MCO tax? That's right. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we've talked about in, in, pri in the prior hearing is that obviously the situation we're in, as we've all acknowledged, is related to what the federal government is telling us we can and can't do. Today we have the MCO tax that we have that doesn't have the impact to the non-Medicaid business that we're now seeing in the proposal that we've put forward. And that's one of the challenges. And so what we have looked at in terms of the options, and as we've talked about, we've tried to figure out a way to minimize that overall impact to the, to the health plan industry, which at the end of the day means to minimize the impact to people out there purchasing health insurance and that for whom the cost will be passed on to. And so that has been one of the challenges, is how do we meet the federal government's requirements while at the same time not causing a, a cost problem for health insurance on the consumer side? Second to that has been you know, the issues that, that have been discussed here with respect to what does it also mean for competition among health plans? It's a very challenging issue when we're talking about taxes to add an additional cost onto a health plan industry where there's very varying degrees of size, uh, participation in the Medi-Cal program and other programs. The tax that has to be structured um, has to tax Medicaid and has to tax things more than Medicaid. But it won't tax Medicare. That's also a federal prohibition. So you can't tax Medicare managed care. So plans that have mostly Medicaid or Medicare business at the end of the day don't have a real significant impact from this tax. Whereas you have you know, half the plans um, that are subject to the tax that have no Medi-Cal and their Medicare business is being taken out, but they're, they're significant commercial payers. And so what we've tried to figure out is how do we structure the tax in a way that doesn't cause as, as significant of a cost impact to those plans as well as making you know looking at are we causing other issues within the industry that we don't intend obviously at the end of the day we don't want to have unintended consequences that we haven't thought of as we structured the tax and so we continue to be open to different types of structures with but the end result has to be that we meet the federal tax we, re, we raise the funding that that we need and that we've done it in a way that doesn't at, that limits the impact on the consumers at the end of the day. And so those are the principles that, that we're coming at it from, and I certainly I think that's being sh that's shared by many who are working on this issue. Unfortunately, you know, I don't think there's a, a, like a, a secret solution that we haven't come up with where no one, you know, there's no financial impact. I just, I, I'd be happy if there was. Hopefully someone can come, can come up with one. But it's how do, we, how do we take the impact that likely will have to come from this type of tax and figure out how to minimize it and have it occur in a way that isn't going to cause other issues. Thank you for that excellent illustration. Mr. Mays. What did we do before uh, 2009? Because the MCO tax came, came in in 2009. What did we do prior to 2009? And, and, and I understand what the federal government is, is, mm -hmm. is, is, has said to us now and why this won't uh, allow to be able to continue on after June of next year. But the MCO tax is a, reason, a relatively new tax. Is that correct? So we've had a version of it since 2005. Um, so prior to that, there was not one. Um, and then there was a, a version of the tax in 2005. And then... Um, and then in 2009, there was a different ver <laughs> different version, and then we've changed the tax rate um, most recently. So prior to that, you know, obviously there was not that funding source for the program. Um, I think that the different the differences that have happened over the last 10 years is the significant increase in the Medi-Cal program just over the last uh, two years or 18 months, we've seen a four million person increase. And so, how do we continue to figure out how to fund the program? 
And obviously, for the last essentially 10 years, the MCO tax has been a way to help fund that in a way that helps to protect access to services. But clearly, prior to that, you know, there was not a tax. We also have other provider taxes that we use in similar ways to help fund a portion of the Medi-Cal program to ensure, again, that we'll have access to those services and not have to be in a situation of having to reduce services or reduce benefits. 